everyone, this is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode in Season 3 of Lawyer On Air. I'm the host of the show, Catherine O'Connell. Today I'm joined by Ho Jun Jun. Ho Jun is currently a Senior Associate in Baker & McKenzie's Tokyo office. She currently leads the office's Construction Focus Group, Digital Transformation Focus Group, and DNI subcommittees regarding work-life balance, race, and ethnicity issues. Baker & McKenzie advises international and domestic companies on a full range of legal and business issues in Japan and overseas. Baker & McKenzie's origins in Tokyo date back to the early 1970s, when the Tokyo Aoyama Law Office was first established in Japan as an associated office of Baker & McKenzie. Baker & McKenzie Tokyo is just celebrating its 50th anniversary in Japan. Educated at Iwa Women's University in Korea and the University of Illinois College of Law, Ho Jun obtained her JD in 2009 and was admitted to the New York Bar in the same year. As a New York qualified lawyer and experienced all around the globe, Ho Jun regularly advises on and negotiates complex construction agreements, subcontracts, concession agreements, joint venture agreements and partnership agreements in relation to infrastructure, power and mine development projects. She does this for major Japanese and Korean companies, both on the investor and the contractor side. Her recent focus also includes renewable energy, such as solar, wind power and battery storage, and also digital transformation. After finishing her undergrad, Ho Jun started her career as an art curator in Washington, D.C., organizing exhibitions for museums and galleries and working with various international artists. And then she went to law school in Illinois. During law school, Ho Jun had the unique experience of summer interning at the permanent mission of Korea to the United Nations in New York in 2007. She's also had in-house experience from 2010 to 14, working for a major construction company in Korea. And she moved to Japan in 2014 and joined another international law firm before Baker and McKenzie. She was also seconded to Toyota Sushou Corporation in 2017 and is there on secondment currently, I believe. And she also had another secondment to Tokyo Gas in 2019. Well, you can tell that Ho Jun has really ticked all the boxes of the full circle of lawyer experience in law firms, on secondment and working in-house. And not only that, Ho Jun is also an author and speaker. She's published two international construction and energy law textbooks in Korean. She's also been published in law journal articles on cross-border investments in the power sector and on and offshore wind power development. Ho Jun and I also work together voluntarily on the XCOM of the Women in Law Japan group. Ho Jun is also on Clubhouse as host of the DX Legal Bento Box. This sounds like a great initiative, bringing a bit of fun and innovation to the law, and I look forward to hearing more about that today. Ho Jun is a trilingual speaker of English, Korean, and Japanese, and she is the mum to her son. And so I hope to hear more too about how Ho Jun is managing to balance all of this work and life. Well, as you can tell from that massive introduction, uh, Ho Jun Jun is very much a lawyer extraordinaire. I'm very pleased to bring her as my guest today. Ho Jun, welcome to the show. Hi, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me today. And it's an absolute pleasure. I mean, as I mentioned to you briefly before, I've been waiting for this you know, exact <laughs> moment. <laughs> I'm so excited today and we're going to be having lots of fun. 
I know you're excited. So we're going to be talking about your career path, uh, the influences that you've had along your journey, how you came to Japan, uh, your work and life in Japan. I'd really love you to also give us some of your tips and ideas for the next generation of associates who are coming up the ranks behind you. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks. All right. So we are talking offline. Um, Oh, online, actually, aren't we? We're not offline, we're online. So we are talking <laughs> online today. But if we were meeting up in person, Hojan, and I hope we can do that soon, do mm. you have a favorite wine bar or cafe or restaurant that you love to go to? And what's your choice of beverage off the menu? Oh, well, actually, there is a cafe called Lupin Quotidian. They have various uh, locations in Tokyo as well, but I like the one in Shiba Koen. Right. It really reminds me of my time in New York City. It was one of the my favorite branch places. The other one is a Spanish place with unlimited sangria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, this place, I usually went with my friends so many times on the weekend. And, you know, I love their uh, latte with huge Ooh. ball. Like it's a really, really big ball. If you can even wash your face out of it. <laughs> but, oh, wow. Yeah. Have you been there recently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very recent, like two weeks ago with my friend and son. Oh, um, yeah, and we can go to the you know, Shiba Koen with a lot of you know flowers. It was yeah. really nice. Wow, so that sounds lovely. Wow. I've done my research on you because I went back and did a Google search of when I first connected with you and it was on email. And I don't know if you remember, but it was when I was a Foreign Women's Lawyers Associate <laughs> membership director and you wrote to us in 2013 and said, please add me to your mailing list. I'm an overseas member. So maybe at that time you were in Korea. Exactly. Well, yes, I was going to mention that today too. <laughs> right. It was before even, you know, Women in Law Japan. Um, That's right. So in 2013, I was about to... No, or I got married to my husband, oh, who is Japanese, mm -hmm. and I was looking to move. And FWLA really connected me with you and Claire Chino. Claire Chino, yes. Right, and Lori. Lori, yes. Mm -hmm. so, wow. Oh, yeah, and Roy Ann. Yes, and Roy Ann too. I also wanted to go back to your early, early days because – before we dive into your career, and I'm going to ask you about your mum also in a moment, but can you remember when you were a child what you wanted to be? I knew I wanted to be a medical doctor because Whoa. it's all because of the influence from my you know, mother's uh, family because my grandpa was doctor, she, my grandma is pharmacist, and my aunties are nurses or Ooh. like dentists. Ooh. So they are all in med. And... <laughs> I'm the only one who did law, but, you know, actually that's why my parents really wanted, I mean, when I entered university, my parents told me to consider, you know, law because we have no, no lawyer in our family. Oh, I see. So they wanted you to be a lawyer because there wasn't one. You yeah. covered, <laughs> you covered everything else almost with the other professions that your family had. How incredible. So you wanted to be in medicine. And then, you know, I know your mum has really played a major influence on you. So tell us a little bit about your mum, the life that she had that really impacted you to be a role model for you. You know, she's in now her late 60s. Right. Uh, she is a pharmacist, as I mentioned, and she's been working since she was 23. And the only time she didn't work was when I was born. So, you know, she was on maternity leave for three or four months. And, and then one day she thought, if I keep staying home, I'll be a monster. So that's oh. when she started, you know, her career again. And since then, she never thought she would quit. And she keeps saying that, you know, she would not retire. She really enjoy her work and, you know, interaction with her patients and, you know, other professionals. Mm. And when I was young, she never told me to study or anything, but she always told me, this is your life. So you'll be responsible for all the consequences. I'm like, I was only like, you know, seven or eight. And that statement was so scary. I'm like, oh, if I don't study now, I have to be responsible for my failure. So that really encouraged, somehow, you know, scared me, but also motivated me to work really hard. Oh, was she speaking for, from her own experience, do you think? Or was she thinking more about you and wanting you to be the best you could be? 
actually her parents had a lot of expectations on her. So she was really stressed and she was the first you know, kid in her family was well, same as me. So she didn't want to give me that pressure. But in fact, I knew she trusted me so much. I had to do well. Oh, I see. And so mm. you're now a working mother and your mum was a working mother. So did you just see her managing her life and work and wanted to be like her? Or are you a little bit different in the way that you lead your working and life as a mum? Well, she has her own pharmacy. So it's a slightly different from me, you know, working in a company or law firm Mm -hmm. and she also had a lot of support so when I was young I never see her her cooking or cleaning or doing laundry at all she always had help but I did see she sacrificed her career for family because she could have pursued you know even like more so-called you know prestigious path but she stayed with her own pharmacy so she can be with us all the time. And yeah, her pharmacy was almost like my playground. I always went there after school, you know, whenever I have trouble, whenever I want to see her. And then I was just there with her patients. <laughs> so everyone knew me. So it was a little bit different, you know, from my experience. But still, I think how she managed her career you know, involved some of her sacrifice. And then I actually see the same thing happening to me. Mm, How is it happening to you in the same way? Maybe it's not really sacrifice. But yeah, I mean, I when I see my son, I love him so much. And I want to spend more time with him. So, you know, not like body body lawyer, (laughs) I, you know, had to turn down some work and, you know, no to, you know, requests. Mm. So that part you could see as sacrifice a little bit right but not going for it for everything not going 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 for it with Mm. the buddy buddy lawyer you're talking about but just edging back a little bit in order to spend some time with your family with your son yes exactly yeah oh i see wow so you studied first back in korea right at iwa Mm -hmm. women's university Mm -hmm. what did you study there well i studied law oh did you you did law there yeah. Was, it, was it a certain kind of law? No, actually, you know, like Japan before, we, in Korea, they have undergrad, I mean, law undergrad as well. Yes. And then there is, now there is JD, but there was nothing like that before. So it was just general law. And how long does it take to qualify or to get through that university course in law in Korea? University itself takes four years and then you have to pass the bar at that time. But now, you know, they change the system just like Japan or the US. Right. So you passed a bar in Korea as well. When I first entered university, I had, you know, this particular conversation with my dad because I know my dad. I knew he would tell me to take the bar exam. And I told him up front, I am not going to do that. And I'm not, I know I'm not, you know, person for that test, you know, sitting and study so long. Mm. I told him I won't do that. And then he said, okay, so still, you know, you can go to law school. (laughs) That was our deal. Wow, really? Gosh. So I guess then when you did finish your undergrad and you started your career, not in law, but in the art world, right, as a curator in Washington, D.C., organizing exhibitions and doing that kind of work, then, I mean, how did that land with your dad? Exactly. (laughs) So (laughs) actually, I minored in art history, too. Oh, I see. And growing up, my mom always loved art, and she brought us, you know, all the exhibitions and the performances and plays. And I was, you know, naturally interested in art. Mm. But I didn't know there was a major called art history. And then my f- university is really famous for art history. And actually, you know, this is the best women's university in Korea. And they started like, you know, female studies and art, you know, and performance art. So it was very famous for that. And as soon as I learned that major, I'm like, oh my God, I'm doing this. And then I minored it. And my grades in art history was always very good. And my mom didn't want to show my transcript to my father (laughs) because compared to art history, my, you know, law grades were not very great. And she's like, daddy will be really, really mad. 
she didn't <laughs> she didn't show my transcript to my dad for a few years. Ooh. And then when I told him about when I, you know, about when I was about to graduate, I told him I'm going to the US to start as an art curator or, you know, even go to graduate school in art there. And he's like, have you lost your mind? <laughs> what are you going to do? You will not make any money and you will just be a loser, blah, blah. He was really, really angry. I still remember that evening. I told him I was going to the U.S. and then he slammed the door in front of me and he went to his room. Yeah, until then, he never said no to what I told him I wanted to do. And especially my parents really raised me just equal to boys. So I thought I was capable of doing anything. But that was the only time he was really, really worried and angry. Wow. And maybe, I don't know if he's talked to you since then. Did he mean to be angry and annoyed then? Or did he just react? He just wanted the best for you. It was coming from a good place. Oh, yeah. He was worried because I'm the only daughter and, you know, daughters. Like he thinks girls has to be protected. And he loved he loves me so much. So he didn't want me to go anywhere. But then once I started you know, my career... He is actually really proud. Mm. So, you know, he tells everyone that, oh, my lo- my daughter is a lawyer working in, like, you know, <laughs> one of the biggest law firms. <laughs> and you are. And so how long were you in Washington, D.C. doing that work with the museums and galleries? My initial plan was to become an art lawyer. Oh. Yeah. So that's how I persuaded my father. Right. So I wanted to experience art for a year and then I already you know had my admission to my law school so Mm. I was going to school but I really had a lot of fun with artists and I mean did some of that law come into that role with negotiating with the artists to bring them into the galleries and that kind of thing was there something about your law and art mix that really worked well with that particular adventure that you were on then since I joined you know construction industry I haven't really had that um, Mm. opportunity but I mean you know on the side like talk or conversation people are always surprised that I have art you know background I would think so is there something you learned or experienced then that helps you now serves you well as a lawyer yeah I think I am more you know probably familiar with diversity like different people you know Mm -hmm. artists think completely different from lawyers right for sure so do you think you have a bit of an artistic or creative brain side of you that works also now within the law firm that you're in I have to admit I'm not creative that's why I probably did you know art history not Mm. art itself Mm. actually when I was young I was painting and all those things but I stopped because I knew that I didn't have that talent well I think art law sounds really exciting I haven't heard anybody do that before so I think that's quite unique about you but you did take yourself off then to Illinois College of Law so this is obviously when law sort of comes to you and you have to do it and were you thinking of your father then or are you thinking it's time for me to now go and do my law properly shall we say at Illinois College of Law tell us about (laughs) that period then Yeah, so in law school, because I wanted to become an art lawyer, Mm. I focused on IP and, you know, commercial contracts. And Mm. I enjoyed it very much. And, you know, that's where I met my husband as well. So you met him in New York? No, in Illinois. Sorry, yes, of course. You were studying at Illinois, but you admitted to the New York bar. So you Mm. met him at uh, Illinois College of Law. Yes. So he, he was sent by the government, I mean, Japanese government, and he was there for a year. Wow. Not wow. how I met him. But to be really honest, I didn't really enjoy studying because I was really lonely, especially after my husband left, you know, after one year, I was so lonely and desperate. And again, you know, my mom and my husband always talked to me whenever I called them and, you know, they advised and, you know, emotionally supported me. So without them, I couldn't go through my JD program, it was really tough because especially, you know, I enjoyed interacting with all these, you know, international students, really interesting people. But most of uh, American, you know, law students, they wanted to be a lawyer 
since they are super young and they always watch, you know, like law and order dramas, soap operas. They're so familiar with this argument, you know, mm. and advocate. Whereas I was like, I didn't want to be a lawyer <laughs> from the first place. And I was into art. So it was so different. Mm-hmm. So I had a lot of hard time during law school. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you had to fight your mm-hmm. feelings inside in order to be quite driven to continue to study and then take the bar. I mean, that must have been really quite hard. Yeah. Yeah. And then during that time, you were doing this summer interning at the permanent mission of Korea to the UN. How did that come about? So my professor in Korea, he was also visiting scholar and also visiting professor at University of Illinois College of Law. And he was previously a um, diplomat. Mm. He had a lot of friends at a permanent mission. So he you know, recommended me to that position. And also he knew that I wanted to join either UN or UNESCO to protect, you know, cultural heritage. Oh, I see. I work at the sixth committee, which is the kind of legal department or mm. like where the, all the conventions and treaties are made. Wow. Okay. How come you didn't stay there or, you know, continue with the UN? What made you continue to go elsewhere rather than stay with them? That's a good question because I thought the UN where, you know, all different people are working together and they are very, very brilliant. So I thought it would be different, but it seemed like just the government, another government and very, very bureaucratic. It was also very political, which I was not very interested. It was all about, you know, lobbying. Of course, you know, if you're legislating law, even in Mm. Congress, like you have to persuade everyone and meet you know, a lot of people and then take them t- to your side. That was a bit too overwhelming to me. I don't know why, but I've got this sort of image of a pinball machine that you've got this law study, you've got arts, you've got the UN stuff coming around. It's like a ball pinging around. And I'm wondering where it suddenly or perhaps gradually you decided that law was really what you wanted to do. Is there some point where that happened? Actually, you know, studying itself was really fun. I like the subject matters. Just Good. my, yeah. uh, I had to compete with, you know, smarter students. <laughs> also, you know, another thing is that English is not my, you know, mother tongue. So I had a lot of hard time with that as well. And also, you know, the education system or style in the U.S. is completely different from Korea. In Korea, in law school, you don't get to say anything. You just listen to your professor's lecture and you take mm-hmm. a note mm-hmm. and you take the exam. That's all. But in the U.S., you know, you have to participate in the discussion and you have to summarize what you read overnight and, you know, all this case law. It was very different. Right. OK, so you did like the study of law. Mm. So what happened then after you'd finished your JD? Did you come to Japan then to come and join your husband? I actually wanted to stay in the US. Right. Actually, you know, I'll, I'll get back to this point later, but I didn't think I would live in Japan at all. Mm. So I wanted to stay in the US and I was looking for a job, but Right at the time, it was, you know, Lehman shock in 2008 when I was, I mean, right before I was graduating and looking for a job, I had many, you know, interviews with big law firms in New York, but then none of them went through because suddenly Lehman shock. So nothing, nothing moves. The hiring freeze it was really, really tough at that time. Yeah. And also, you know, I was so into IP or art law and New York City, which is a bit, you know, too narrow for a first year lawyer out of law school. If I go back and if I can give uh, advice to myself, I would say, don't be too picky, you know, just explore, you know, other areas, even though you are, you may not be interested at that time but at the time I was so into IP I only was looking for IP you know practice or IP Mm. group and it narrowed down and then from Illinois to New York City it was very difficult because you know my school was really well known in Chicago area or Illinois area but not in New York City 
so that made things even harder but I didn't want to give up so I just kept you know thinking of IP law and in New York City. Did you take the bar exam then in New York City itself? Yeah. I see. I was yeah doing some kind of summer job in Chicago and prepared the New York bar in Chicago and then flew to New York City to take the bar exam. Mm. And you got it, right? And then what happened? Without having a job, I anyways moved to New York City because, you know, that's where I wanted to live forever. It was tough, but I was lucky to have a friend who helped me advise artists. She's an alumni of my law school in New York City, and she had a like, similar dream with me. She wanted to become a fashion business owner as well as a lawyer. And she's, you know, much senior than senior to me, but... She was kind enough, you know, to offer me some kind of work and she taught me how to do, you know, legal research and advise clients. And we advised, yeah, various artists on trademark and copyright, basically. But even then, even in New York City, IP right was all about patent, you know, that's where you make money. Mm -hmm. I mean, artists are not, at least the artists that I was um, dealing with were not very rich so the legal fee was too much for them if they work with a big law firm so we you know as solo practitioners we were able to support them but I knew that it's going to be tough for me as well to make living only if I was you know supporting artists wow so you you didn't think then of both of you doing fashion business law and art law together as a, a small boutique firm Right. But I was too young. I was only, Mm. you know, (laughs) I mean, out of law school, I didn't know anything. But now, you know, the friend of mine is a successful business owner, like fashion business owner in New York. And she's also a lawyer. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm. And then I, I mean, to make living, I joined a small law office handling like real estate and immigration transactions. Okay. So your husband's still in Japan though, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You, we did long distance like for eight, seven, eight years. Oh my goodness. Yeah, now I cannot even think about, you know, being away from him, but oh. that's what we did. There you go. I, I just can't believe it that you did have that period of time away from each other and you just traveled back and forth, both of you. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then you finally did come to Japan though. Do you found a, a role and you came over to work at an international law firm here, right? Yeah, but I didn't come to Japan. Yeah, it takes like five more years for me <laughs> from New York. <laughs> Tell us about that, Hojan. Yeah, so when I was practicing in New York, everything it was, you know, about New York and, you know, the U.S. is center of the world. So they are not interested in outside of the U.S. They really think, oh, you know, the world has to run by our rule. I didn't like that. And I wanted to do more international deals. And until then, I didn't know Korean companies were so active all over the world. So I quit my job. And at that time, my partner asked me a few times whether I wouldn't be regretting because Mm -hmm. he could give me a green green card in the US and he really liked me. Mm. I've never regretted. I returned to Korea and I joined this construction company. I enjoyed so much the work and the colleagues. I traveled all over the world. And, you know, I never thought about joining construction, right? Uh, I always wanted to art or fashion. So it was really different. But, you know, the work itself it was really fun. And I, my deals were at least $1 billion, something like that. So big scale. Right. But you talked about being very focused on trademarks and IP, copyright, and then suddenly you're broadening into construction. Right. What's going on? How did that happen? I know, right? (laughs) Yeah. What's happened that your mind has gone broader? I guess at that point I realized, yes, I do like art. Uh, I was interested in intellectual property. But also, you know, as a junior lawyer, I have to learn basic corporate and, you know, contracts, right? And then also, there were a lot of opportunities in Korea when I came, I returned. But, you know, construction was really international. 
So it was, you know, so, so, so much fun. At first, I was also, you know, like doubting, would I really like construction? But actually, I enjoy it so much. And now I don't really think about IP anymore. Of, of course, I love art and I still go to galleries and, you know, meet artists, but I enjoy, you know, my practice area very mm, much. What is it about construction that you like? The scale and you get to travel all over the world and meet different people. And another thing is that as you get better in one area, you get to like it. Construction is very, very complex. And there aren't so many people who are, you know, practicing construction law. So as time goes by, I just get to know more about it. And then I am getting better. And I'm more confident. And I enjoy doing it. Right. And maybe working in the construction company itself, you were right at the coalface or right in the middle of things. And so perhaps that was really part of the enjoyment to be with a company that was doing it day by day, as mm -hmm. opposed to being in a law firm that was advising construction companies. Is that some aspect that also was enjoyable for you? As a junior lawyer, I was really lucky to handle this really big transaction in Australia. This was iron ore mining project yes. in Western Australia. Yes. So I traveled to Perth so many times, like more than other Australians. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you know, the total time I stayed in Perth was like eight months or so. Mm. And this was the biggest investment ever for this company's history. And it was like, you know, five, six billion Australian dollars. Mm. And I was the only lawyer in the project team. And because it's such a significant investment, CFO, CEO, they directly called me and wanted to talk to me about, you know, all the risks. So that gave me a lot of autonomy. So I think, you know, the difference between in-house and private practice is that even if you are a junior lawyer, if you are in-house, you have a lot of autonomy and you are, you know, like the general counsel to this project, right? And Luckily for me, the first project happened to be such a big deal and it was like so famous. It gave me all the opportunity in the future as well. So I enjoyed that very much, I think. How's your mom and dad thinking at this time when they see you working as hard as you are and <laughs> enjoying it? How are they? What are they saying to you at this time? Actually, the funny thing is that this is the company where they worked too. <laughs> Is that right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's the biggest uh, steel maker oh. in Korea. And also, you know, third biggest steel maker in the world. And it, this is, you know, construction arm of that group. And actually the CEO is friend of, was friend of my father and mother. But I didn't get into that job just because I knew them. I mean, they, yeah. didn't, they <laughs> didn't know I was applying even. How interesting. So, yeah, I had really hard to inter hard interviews and things. But anyways, you know, I got in and then they were so surprised that I was joining the company. And CEO and vice president were talking, did you know Ho Jung is joining? I didn't know that. Like we have to call, call you know, the father. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. yeah. So I enjoyed, you know, that like kind of, I grew up in with this company when I was young, right? How long were you there for? Four years. Okay, four years. And that takes you through to what year? 2010 to 2014. 14, okay. Yeah, that's right. when I finally moved to Japan. Okay, you finally moved to Japan. So you joined an international firm here for a little while mm -hmm. and then moved over to Baker & McKenzie. So how was it different working in Japan compared to where you were in South Korea. Oh, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a transition. It's not mm. only because, you know, I changed the countries, but also, you know, from in-house to private practice. What was different? So in terms of the country, although, you know, Japan and Korea share a lot of similar cultures, once I started speaking Japanese more fluently, I made, you know, a lot of Japanese friends. Mm. But before moving to Japan, I couldn't even speak one word in Japanese. Yeah, that was, again, a big challenge. Although I passed, you know, the JLPT, the language, oh. you know, yes. um, 
language test level one, it doesn't mean that you can, you know, speak that fluently. Right? It's more risk writing and listening, isn't it? Rather right, than right. speaking. Okay. Exactly. So Japanese was already difficult to me and, you know, being like a business Japanese speaker, like, mm. you know, business level Japanese is, was even more difficult. Right. I mean, so even you, now I'm not perfect. Right. right? So you used uh, English with your husband as mm-hmm. your... I see. Yes, all I see. the time. Like wow. now it changes a lot because yes. I speak you know, Japanese more fluently. Goodness. But before it was 100% in English. And right. yeah, and one thing I was so surprised in Japan is that in Korea, I saw so many female general counsel or in-house counsel. But in Japan, at least in 2014, I didn't see almost any. Like only one or two people, like, you know, including Claire yes, and another person at Toyota Zusho, they were like really prominent, you know, leading female lawyers. But then, especially in my industry, you know, construction or energy mining, really, there was no female counsel. So I was very mm. surprised. And successful female lawyers don't have family. So I was very sad, which was very different from Korea. And another thing was maybe you are, I mean, as a junior, you are not supposed to talk to the executives. Yeah. So it's, it was different. And private practice versus in-house. Oh, God. <laughs> I didn't know partners were that important. Because mm. when I was in-house, I only talked to partners and I talked to, you know, all the executives like daily basis. I didn't know partners were that important. How did you find out they were important? Well, they say that, <laughs> right? Like partners talk, partners do, you know, only partners are allowed to do this, to do this, mm. partners only. Everything, if you are not partner in private practice, I don't know. I mean, back then, especially, I was already, you know, eight, eight years ago, nine years ago. Mm. It was more, even more conservative at that time. So... I found it very difficult and different. Right. So, you know, I remember one time I said to my mentor, who was senior associate at that time, I kept telling him, I was a kacho, you know, I was the manager in Korea, but now I'm treated like, you know, invisible. And I was so frustrated. But, you know, now I think about it it's so funny, you know, who cares whether you're a kacho or not? <laughs> but, yeah, I didn't really get that. Mm, big change. And so you now are on two D and I subcommittees. I think one is work life balance and the other race ethnicity. Is this all coming from your New York days and from your time in Korea? Are these things that really matter to you mm. and for you to help others with in the firm? Exactly. Especially. Work-life balance, because I, you know, now have a kid, it's really important. And also, you know, Baker cares about work-life balance very much. And I do think we are doing very well in, in you know, that sense. And the race, eth- ethnicity, yes, it matters so much even in Japan, although I'm, you know, same Asian, I'm treated differently just because I'm not Japanese, mm-hmm. but Asian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they say if you want something done, you ask a busy person. So you seem very busy with all of what you're doing with your work and life. Why are these committees so important for you? I actually did change uh, some policies within our office, you know, Mm -hmm. to be more, you know, friendly to working parents. How did you change them? What, What did you change? So I initiated this conversation to change the policy I mean, I cannot go in detail because no, you know, it's kind it's of, fine. You know, yeah, but before we changed this policy, a lot of people were uncertain about, you know, like pregnancy, you know, what's the rule around it and like maternity leave, what my career will change and all these things. And then more support for working parents, like financially and also, you know, as a culture within the firm. So I led this conversation with management and then we published the new rule to help us make it more transparent transparent and also supportive for you know brilliant parents yeah I'm very proud of my team you know 
Yeah, it's great. Did you also take maternity leave after the policy had been changed? How long can you take and what kind of support can people get? Ah, actually, I took the maternity leave before the policy changed. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky that my team are very supportive for my, you know, family responsibility. Yeah. It was not always like that. When I was younger, I was even told I shouldn't start the family until I'm established in the farm. Mm, what does established mean, though? That's the- Exactly. Exactly. Oh, I was asking, and then I didn't mm. get the response. And then also, you know, mm. maybe it could mean, you know, partnership or, you know, or because I was just, I just joined the farm. So maybe, you know, have more connection subjective. with the feet. Huh? Yeah. yeah, it could be subjective. Wow. Is there anything else here that you wanted to talk about in the DEI space? And also, you know, ethnicity and race is also very, very dear to me. Cause, uh, not yes. dear, but so close to me. I cannot just, you know, let it go. People are discriminated based on their nationality or race because I have experienced it. I'm mm. still experiencing it and changing the bias is really important or stereotypes but I see you know a lot of changes since 2014 more diversity really what's one thing you can do to help people think differently about bias how to change bias I think communication is the key I mean people tend to stereotype and you know generalize things because it's easy And I've been fighting against all sorts of biases, especially, you know, since I moved to Japan. And I found it more so in private practice because, you know, usually you graduate from law school and you you did well at school and then you join as a junior associate and then you keep, you know, like growing up within private practice. And then there isn't really diversity, I think, but working in you know, this like really international law firm, I get to meet, you know, all different kind of people from, you know, all over the world. And we, you know, try to understand each other personally. And then, you know, that makes everything so easy. So I'm not, you know, only talking about this, like bias or things within my, you know, environment, but as you know, whole, especially in Japan and so that society, people, I think really have strong stereotype. For example, I'm a Korean. So everyone think, oh, you must like kimchi. I have left the country for a long time and I, I'm really international. So <laughs> I sometimes find it so like unfair that people, you know, generalize an individual without considering her or his background or, you know, uniqueness. Mm, making some assumptions Mm, yeah yeah. I see wow let's flip a little bit here because I know there's another unusual thing that you do right now which is clubhouse you're the host of this dx digital transformation legal bento box Mm -hmm. this sounds like such a great initiative bringing perhaps a bit of fun and innovation to the law is this related to the digital transformation focus group that you lead or how did this come about Yeah, exactly. Because of of my expertise in construction, I'm also interested in smart cities. And smart city is, you know, like a complex digital transformation. And then I first joined this digital transformation focus group within our office. And then my partner and another associate, we were like, oh, now Clubhouse is booming. So why don't we try it? And then we talk about, you know, digital transformation and law. So we started in March 2021. And so it's been a year. And then we touched upon so many different, you know, topics such as I mentioned, you know, smart cities and drone or, you know, EVs, automatic, you know, vehicles. And recently, you know, I'm keep talking about my areas, but, you know, (laughs) energy transition and digital transformation and ESG, you know, all these like, you know, trendy issues. And it's more casual. We do have clients and also, you know, Baker McKenzie internal lawyers. And the discussions are really interesting. And I learned so much 
it's not like seminar, but you get to, you know, ask questions and it's really interactive and casual and it's not recorded. So everyone is kind of feel free to speak up and ask, you know, whatever questions they want to ask. It's been really fun. And because of this initiative recently, I presented in front of the Hanoi Bar Association uh, regarding digital transformation and energy transition with my colleagues. So yeah, it gave me a lot of you know, new opportunities. Mm, it's great, isn't it? I mean, Clubhouse, I know, is, is still popular in Japan, especially. Um, but it sounds great to be able to bring in your clients and also your internal lawyers to just create a different format and a different environment. Mm. As you say, it's more casual. It's it's not recorded. People can actually be opening up a little bit more to talk about the things that are on their mind. And mm -hmm. how great it led to another opportunity for you to go and speak in what, Vietnam, Hanoi? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Online, of course, not traveling, but. Oh, yeah. Well, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Oh, unfortunately, next time. But that's that's fantastic. Wow. Was that your idea to bring this up? Was it the three of you? You'd mentioned a partner and another person. Is that your idea? No, well, we three of us been, you know, talking about digital transformation and new things, but we didn't, I mean, I didn't particularly suggest it, but my partner mm. was, I mean, he's really interesting and fun. So he was thinking of different things. And then Clubhouse at that time was super popular and you couldn't get on the web app if, if you don't have, you know, invitation. You had, yeah, you had to be invited and now it's a little yeah. more open. That's a year ago. Well, congratulations on that. So is the future of law for you about these topics, DX, ESG, drones, smart cities? I mean, they're not just trendy issues, are they? What's your dream for the, the future of law? Well, you know, there are a lot of people saying that AI will take over our job, but I doubt it. <laughs> All of us have very unique experience and there are, of course, you know, common theme or a common, you know, aspect of all the matters. But what we do is really based on our experience and, you know, think about the creative way to help the client and digest it so that the client can understand the difficulty legal, you know, concepts. So even though I'm a big supporter of technology and AI, I don't. No, it will still take a lot of time for AI really, you know, mm -hmm. take over our roles. And I see there are many ways to efficiently deal with difficult um, or complicated legal topics. So I think that that'll be helpful. And then it will open up to the public, I mean, like, you know, general or normal people would think law is not difficult anymore. So I think that that'll change a lot too. Mm. And just as you see, law is involved in every area like ESG or, you know, antitrust, like merger filing, digital transformation, and even like, you know, as I mentioned, EV or electric vehicles and automated vehicles, everything mm. involves law. So I think the future of law is bright. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we will be challenged by more complex issues. And we have to be more creative and open to, you know, new challenges and changes. Right. And so what's one thing that you're learning right now? I think crisis is not really crisis, but as you know, people say turning crisis into opportunity, like, you know, COVID gave me the opportunity right after maternity leave, I had to, you know, work from home from day one and I didn't get to see my uh, my colleagues for two years or so but it actually gave me a lot of opportunities by having a creative thinking mm. try to connect and communicate even online or virtually and now I got to know more colleagues and clients and I have more opportunities for public speaking and mm. taking you know quite a few leadership role within my office so I I have to think that Everything is happens for a reason. Mm, for sure. Wow. So you're learning a lot about yourself right now and the opportunities and taking advantage of things that come across your path. Mm, yeah. Well, mm. especially so because my family got COVID earlier last month. <laughs> that made me really think a lot about myself. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you're really thinking about yourself, your future, your health, all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. 
going back to the bias and stereotypes, like I know, especially in private practice, you know, you and also for junior lawyers, it tends to be intimidating. Like it can be scary, but all those, you know, bias or criticism, they are all the limiting beliefs and you should be away from those people who say them to you and just trust in yourself and know your strengths and work on that more and more. And then it will give you more opportunity and the confidence. And I had a lot of difficulties, but I you know, have proved myself. And yes, it is tough. And some people even say you don't have to prove yourself since you know, others' opinions are not important. But in our industry, it's a bit difficult. I mean, if you're not strong enough, it's difficult to be not influenced by what others say. So believe yourself and then, you know, keep doing what you think that's right for you and keep moving and keep developing. I think that's what is really important for this career. Mm, Well, I was going to ask you about your top tips, but I think you've just given them. And, (laughs) you know, being more brave, being more trusting of yourself, being more vulnerable and open. Mm. That's what I'm hearing from you. Yeah, I'm not perfect yet. I still don't know how to handle negative feedback. I I try to develop, I try to grow based on those, you know, negative feedback, but still it hurts, right? And I'm not perfect. I try really hard. And, you know, I was shocked when I was told I should not have family. But now I understand as I grow a little bit senior, I'm always also afraid. What if one of my team will be on leave? then, you know, it'll affect the work very much. But you have to learn how to deal with those difficulties or how to, you know, work with your team. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, really happy and grateful. My team are so supportive. They are not only just understanding that I have a kid who doesn't allow me to work when he's around, (laughs) but also we shift time so everyone can work on the same thing, but on different, you know, time schedules. Mm, it's very and it was, it was not like that before but because you mm. communicate and you talk to them and it's kind of you train them right <laughs> mm. so how do you manage your day how does it look from morning through till the end of the day uh, so I try to wake up early but because of the quarantine period it kind of ruined right now but I'm trying to go back to the routine but I wake up early like five six and then mm get some work done before my son wakes up. And when he wakes up, he wouldn't like me doing anything else, just looking after him. So when he wakes up, I start preparing for his nursery and breakfast. And then my husband to go to work. Mm -hmm. Once they go out of the door around at 9 (laughs) a.m., I have only limited time until 6 p.m. So I am really, really focused and try to get everything done within the day. Mm. And yeah, once my son, son comes back at six, from that time until he goes to sleep, I have to be his slave <laughs> 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 or play with him. Although I have, you know, help every evening, it's really difficult to work while he's around. So yeah, I try to focus on my son during that time and if I needed I go back to work after he goes to sleep but recently he goes to sleep even later and later so my free time <laughs> is getting less and less I don't know how to handle this but mm, yeah. new challenge yeah so what's a snapshot of just an ordinary slice of your life that brings you real joy my son yeah. <laughs> I knew you're gonna say that Sorry. No, actually, Catherine, I have to admit that I was not very interested in kids. And my husband is actually really, really surprised that I am such a loving mother because he thought I would just abandon (laughs) my son. (laughs) And some people told me that they thought I wouldn't have a kid because I was so focused on my career and I write a lot and I do a lot of public speech. So people thought I wouldn't have time to do that. But you know, I had a lot of hard time to have my kid. So it's so precious just to have him around. Mm. And I, I am also surprised how much I love him. Fabulous. So, yeah, I yeah. one thing I want to tell, you know, junior 
female lawyers is that there is no right time. I hear a lot from like, you know, younger people that, oh, I, I'm afraid, you know, if I have kids right now, I, I mean, my career will end here. Why do you think that way? Mm. Um, everyone has different, you know, paths and there is no just like one size fits all answer. But yeah, it seems like it is a very scary topic. And I do understand because I've been through that, but there is no right timing. So just do whatever happens to you and or happen for you and thrive. And it, it, yeah, I cannot believe how much I love, love my son. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so how do you encourage yourself? Where's this mindset coming from? Do you have a, a focus or a, a word of the year that guides you? That's a good question. I haven't really thought about it. I want to do well. Actually, I want to be perfect, although I'm not. So I try hard to prove myself to myself, actually. Mm. So mm. that motivates me a lot. And I want to have like results. I am result driven, but that's why I'm always a bit stressed. But <laughs> it's kind of, you know, hard to have a balance, but that's how I motivate myself. And also, you know, I have really good supporters in my family. My husband and my mom have been always emotionally supportive. So, mm. Yeah, they keeps me, uh, they keep me motivated too. Big question. Success yeah. is <gasps> fill in the oh, blank. Goodness. I've never thought about it. Success is you have control over what you are doing and you enjoy what you are doing. Mm. I think. Great. I love it. Yeah, that's why actually, Catherine, I think you, I mean, you are very inspiring. <laughs> this is about you, not me. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. But I always try to look for, you know, like role models Lovely. in various Thank areas. You. That's great. Thank you so much. Well, is there anything else that we've not talked about today that you want to talk about or something we did talk about that you would love to re-emphasize? Well, I guess it's a re-emphasizing what I have been saying, but I think, you know, you really have to be brave and always do things out of your comfort zone. And I think that's how you develop and grow. And recently, I've been following this person who is not taking a conventional, you know, lawyer path, but that, you know, like look around and find the role model in various areas really is helpful. I want to know who that is. <laughs> you don't have to tell me, but very, very interesting. I'm really glad to hear that, though, that you are out of your comfort zone and taking a non-conventional path. Thank you so much. I want to head into the final round for today, which is usually a quick fire round of six questions. I ask every guest to wind up the interview. So the first one, Hojan, is if I gave you a million yen <laughs> in Japanese cash, right? A million yen. Where would you spend it? Your favorite store or destination? Maybe it's artwork, but tell me what you'd do with that. Does it have to be in Japan? No. <laughs> then I would go to Hawaii. Oh, why? Yeah, that's my dream to live in Hawaii. Um, you know, it's it's also a melting pot, right? And also yes. there are a lot of Japanese population. So yes, my family feel comfortable, especially we are, you know, mix of Japan and the Korea. Mm, wow, nice. And so next question is, is there a podcast or book or some mm. tv program that you are looking at listening to reading that you recommend actually i don't want to tell anyone but <laughs> <laughs> i will disclose here i am recently i'm not recently only but yeah i've been following tony robbins who is a life and career coach yes. in the u.s is really famous right and it sure is and he himself is entrepreneur mm -hmm. and I'm always amazed how good he is to connect, you know, his business with his friend's business and they are successful together. Mm. Also, of course, it's kind of annoying sometimes because it's too much info commercial. But if <laughs> you can take that for your you know, business, I think it's really good. Do you read books as well? 
His books, yeah. Oh, you read his books. <laughs> so yeah. in one sentence, what does that say about you, those books and programs that you're thinking about with Tony? Earlier this year, I, w- I joined his free four-day seminars or mm. training on five day and actually started from 4 a.m in oh Japan. i've heard about that yes the four four or five day thing yeah i've heard yeah. about it you um, did that mm-hmm. wow i woke up every morning at 4 a.m i was so excited i was happy and happier happier as the training goes by so what does it say about you it sounds like inquisitive or trying things that are new what is it saying about you being driven to do this well, because of COVID, I've been working from home, you know, so long, like seriously, mm. two, two years. And I wanted to change because I couldn't travel either, right? Usually I travel a lot and I felt like I was imprisoned in my apartment. <laughs> so I wanted to change. Actually, what I said today has been influenced by his, you know, trainings a lot too. Ooh. Like, you know, for example, everything happens for a reason. Although I've always liked this saying in, you know, Chinese or Japanese and Korean too, they all have this saying, Sayo ga uma. Mm. Yeah, it's from like, you know, Chinese classic and the culture, this area shares that classics. And yeah, I think that's one of the yeah, favorite saying that I, well, that's so good because one of my next questions was, what's your favorite saying? But everything oh. happens for a reason. And my other question was, is there someone famous you want to meet? And I'm thinking it might be Tony. Ah, uh, no. Maybe. <laughs> Anyone else? You A famous celebrity or person that you would love to meet or have already met? I cannot think of anyone. Okay. We'll call it as Tony Robbins. I'm sure you'd love to meet him. <laughs> okay. Surely. <laughs> Oh, no, actually, Christine Lagarde. Oh, why? Because, you know, she was the ex-chairman of Baker a long time ago. Sure, she was, yes. Yes, yes. She was the first female chairman. And everyone who met her before, my colleagues say she's, you know, such a, like outstanding person. She's very kind and nice. But also when she's in the room, everyone knows she's there. So I want to see what it's like. Mm, you've got me thinking. Mm, sounds fantastic. And last question, Hojan, is what's one thing you are deeply grateful for right now? <laughs> Family. <laughs> Great. I think, yeah, it's kind of boring, right? But I do really. No, yeah. It's not boring at all. I think it's mm-hmm. perfect answer. Well, thank you so much. We've come to the end of the podcast and I've just so enjoyed speaking with you i know a lot about you but there's so much you shared that i i didn't know and you've been really brave and trusting and uh, vulnerable today and i'm really thankful for you sharing your story so much no thank you i really really enjoyed and i appreciate that you invited me to speak here Um, oh i really enjoyed it how can people um get in touch with you would that be linkedin or through your website yeah linkedin that is and also clubhouse oh Um, yes clubhouse of course yeah they have to join clubhouse and then connect with you in that way right (laughs) that'd be great okay well i don't think we've had a clubhouse connection in our show notes but we will put that in there today so that people who want to connect with you can do that on linkedin or clubhouse Well, we'll finish there. We've had a fantastic conversation and I'm really grateful for you being in this third season of Lawyer on Air. And I really want to thank you again for your openness and your honesty. Um, And for my listeners, please do like this episode, subscribe to Lawyer on Air and do drop us a short review as that really helps Lawyer on Air be seen and heard by more people. And you can actually pop on over to my web page and leave me a voicemail as well and we do love hearing actual voices of people telling us how they thought about the show and and what they loved hearing from the guests so do go ahead share the episode with someone else you think would enjoy listening to it and be inspired to live a wonderful lawyer extraordinaire life that's all for now see everyone on the next episode cheers kampai and bye for now 
Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer on Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. It's my passion to share my stories of amazing legal ladies, so please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I would love to connect with you, so jump on over to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter or Insta, where you can find me. The links are in the show notes below. Well, that's all from me today, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer on Air. Cheers, kampai, and bye for now.